Well, it's good to see you all. I do want to share with you, you've probably already kind of been figuring this out, but we do have all of our restrooms back available for use, and we're going to keep on praying for that situation going forward. I'll just say that, all right? <laughs> for right now, we're doing all right. Um, let me mention to you, uh, that, of course, if you are on the prayer email distribution list, you'd know about this, but Miss Agnes Ritchie had gone to be with the Lord, very committed believer in Jesus, and, uh, of course, that's, uh, I see Gary and Denise back there, and uh, Anna Grace, but, of course, Noah married Cheyenne, and this is Cheyenne's grandmother, and it's uh, Mary Carter's sister-in-law, but let's... Uh, Let's be praying for them. Let's look to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord, how we're thankful, God, that we can look to you, Lord, and that, Lord, you are sufficient. Lord, uh, we thank you, God, that we who know Christ and the pardon and forgiveness of sins and, and having loved ones who likewise would know you as Savior, Lord, that we do not have to sorrow as those who have no hope. And, Lord, that we know that a parting that we have of them, with them in this earthly life, but a temporary thing. Lord, we pray for your comfort to this family. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts as we're here together and worship to you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Would you all stand with me as we begin our time of worship with a hymn? The worship today comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 12. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my disease. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. 
He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. And 
For you today, God, in humble submission. Speak to us through your word this morning. Be with Pastor Glenn as he brings the message. We love you and we continue to praise you this morning, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
you remember from last week, as we've been going through this Gospel of John, just to kind of get us up to speed, that Jesus had escaped a stoning attempt in Jerusalem, and he's down near the Jordan River where multitudes were believing in him. And so with that as backdrop, I want to pick up this morning in John chapter 11 and read verses 1 through 16. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he, so when he heard that he, Lazarus, was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, Just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? Aren't there twelve hours in a day? Jesus answered. If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble, because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, Lazarus' death. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go too, that we may die with him. I want to speak to you this morning something that maybe wouldn't so much jump out at you from this text, but yet it's spoken to us from this text. I want to speak to you today on this subject, why God doesn't answer our prayers immediately. You ever wondered about that? Why God doesn't answer our prayers immediately. Have you ever asked God for something? And I mean the thing that you were asking him for, you needed, an an you needed an answer right away. Maybe the thing you were asking him about was for the healing of a loved one. Or maybe it's some problem that is just so hard that you just needed the resolution of that thing and you needed it right away. And although you needed an answer right away, you still didn't get it. And you were like David who cried out to God in Psalm 69, verse 17. Don't hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me quickly. You were like Mary and Martha in our story this morning as a breathless messenger arrives and says to Jesus, Quick, Jesus, come on back to Bethany. Lazarus is sick. And so we would expect that Jesus, having heard that, and loving them as we know that he loved them, and as even we read about within this text, we would expect that having heard the news that this dear friend Lazarus was sick, and that this, and he loved him, and he loved Martha, and he loved Mary, and knowing what's going on in their hearts for those who, who loved him, that is the sisters, and Lazarus, I mean, he's in the condition. He's in, we would expect that Jesus would just like that, immediately leave for Bethany, but the Bible tells us here that intentionally Jesus delays going. And so when we hear that, that goes against our expectations of what Jesus would have done because we're thinking, well, after all, Jesus loved them, but that doesn't seem to fit. 
And I just try to picture what's going on. Not all of this is revealed in the text, but we can think about it like you've got a loved one and, and they're just terribly sick and, and you just love them so dearly and you're thinking about Jesus coming and, and that when Jesus gets there, he's going to be able to handle the situation. And so I just kind of picture it there that Mary and Martha, they're pacing the floor, they're waiting for Jesus. And they were there at the deathbed of their brother Lazarus. And can't you just see Lazarus there as with every breath he's struggling to breathe? And every time he opens his eyes, he expects that he's going to be able to see Jesus having just arrived, and then that's going to make things all right. And Mary and Martha, they're there, and they're using the cool, wet claws putting that across his forehead and just doing whatever they can to try to ease his fever. And the whole time, I don't know what it's like, like we think about, we got windows, but the whole time it's like they're looking out the window, they're expecting to see Jesus, the Savior of their situation, to arrive any time, and then that's going to make everything all right. But Jesus is a no-show, and Lazarus dies. And the Bible tells us that Martha and Mary go into mourning and they lovingly wrap the corpse of their brother into strips of cloths and they lay him in a shallow cave and they roll the stone across the opening. Still no Jesus. Now can you imagine what was going through the minds of the sisters by this point? I think there's probably a good chance if you, you've had the same kind of experience, or at least anybody that's lived any length of time, you've had this kind of experience. You're facing a crisis. You're saying, oh God, God, I need you to help me in this situation. And you need an immediate response. But all the time that you're crying out to God, heaven is silent. And so as we're thinking this morning about why it is that God doesn't answer our prayers immediately, I'm going to divide our thoughts into two main subjects. Here's the first thing I want us to look at this morning. Number one, there are some common misunderstandings we often have as to why God doesn't answer our prayers immediately. Here's the first common misunderstanding. Sometimes we fall into believing that God must not know what we're going through. You see, when Jesus didn't immediately hurry to Bethany, Mary and Martha, they might have begun to wonder, doesn't Jesus know our need? I mean, the messenger that's trying to get the word to Jesus, did he, did he ever get there and did he ever get the word out to Jesus? And you may think that God's not really aware of what you are going through. But I want to remind you of this passage, and there are many others that could make the same point about what we are able to know about God as it relates to this. Psalm 147, verse 5. Our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. That means he knows everything. He sees everything. And as he knows everything and he sees everything, he's able to see what it is that you are going through. And so sometimes we fall into believing that God must not know what we're going through, that that's one of the common in, in misunderstandings we have as to why God doesn't, doesn't answer our prayers immediately. But here's a second common misunderstanding, number two. Sometimes we're tempted to think that although God knows about our need, He just doesn't care. He just doesn't care. We're going to read a little bit later in this chapter that Martha went out to meet Jesus, that is, as He's arriving on the scene. And so Martha goes out to meet Him. And let me just tell what's really getting on. We don't want to sort of flower it over. Let's just tell it like really what's going on. The way you read it is really the way it is. You see, she gave Jesus a piece of her mind. 
And she said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even when you read it, not having the benefit of video or recording devices, you can almost hear the accusation in her voice. What she was saying, in essence, was this. Don't rush to help us now. It's too late for Lazarus. That's really what she's saying. And when Mary met him just a little bit later, she said basically the same thing that Martha had said. said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then even as Jesus approached the tomb, some of the people asked, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? And sometimes when our prayers don't seem to be answered, what we are prone to do and in our humanness, we do this and Mary and Martha did it. I tell you what, am I the only one, but I'm benefited by reading the Word of God and being able to see how these people struggled and how they showed their humanness. And it didn't all just look all spiritual about them all the time. Because, you know, I can really identify with that a whole lot better than I can the, the person that just seems like they just so walking with God all the time that nothing ever bothers them. Because, you know, my life's not like that. I don't live like that. And sometimes, as I said, when our prayers don't seem to be answered, we want to get into the blame game with God. We say something like, well, God, if only you had fill in the blank. Because they had the thing they filled in the blank. But the Bible teaches us in many places that God really does care for us. I don't know about you. Do you need to be reminded of that sometimes? I guarantee you I need to be reminded of it. I guess one of the most memorable passages that comes to mind, and I've included it here for us, 1 Peter 5, 7, that speaks about how God cares for us, says this, Casting all your cares on Him because He cares about you. Whatever you're going through, it might just be, sometimes it just be like, hey, it's not like necessarily circumstances are really bad outwardly. A lot of times they are, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just, you just kind of in this kind of emotional dither. I don't know. <laughs> and you just need to be reminded that God cares for you. I especially want you to notice from our text, John 11, verse 5, where it says this. So easy to pass over this. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Let that sink in. I love the fact that the Scriptures point out here that Jesus loved for them, as they're going through all this, I mean, Lazarus, he's at the point of death, and then later he dies, of course. And the Bible says that his love was personal to each of them. Doesn't it help you today to be reminded that, you know, we think about, well, God loves the world. Well, I'm grateful you're thinking he loves the world, but what about me? And I want to tell you, and be reminded of this and take it away, that God loves you personally. So we do have that general sense that God loves everyone, but we need to drive it down home and get reminded of it. And even when our emotions, because of our thoughts or whatever it is, have us sort of down or whatever it is that we're feeling in the moment, we need to understand that God's love is personal. God loves you personally personally put your name in there god loves me personally remember one of the passages that is such a blessing to me and i try to 
You know, you've got those passages of scriptures you try to keep going back to. David, you know, David had, it, there are all these passages in the Psalms that are dealing with emotions. And we've all got them. We have times maybe we're down. And I love what David said. He said, let the morning bring me news of your unfailing love. And let that just kind of be your default position. That you just remind yourself. Because you wake up sometimes, <laughs> you're not feeling so hot, right? And I've talked to some others, they get a little older, they got a little more pains, I understand that better. And, and just be wise enough to remind yourself, let the morning bring me that news of your unfailing love. We've, we've sung about it this morning. We've, we've heard it read in the scriptures already this morning. And what about that wonderful, simple song that most of us learned when we were little children? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. He really does. I didn't plan to say this, but I just got reminded of this, that there's this world-renowned theologian that was meeting with all these students. and I mean, probably one of the greatest theological minds who's ever lived. And he was asked that question. What is it that's the greatest truth you've ever learned and that, that means so much? And he just quoted from that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, let's look here a little bit further. A third thing, sometimes we may fall into believing that God's too busy running the universe to get involved in what's going on in our lives. God's omnipotent. He's in charge. He's the sovereign God. And yet this same sovereign, omnipotent God cares for you and me personally. In Luke 12, verses 6 and 7, Jesus said this, Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There are, who knows, billions of sparrows on this planet. In other words, they're so numerous that they're uncountable. And in a parallel passage to this, Matthew 10, Jesus said, listen to this closely, Jesus said that the Father knows, listen very closely, the Father knows every time a sparrow, here's the expression I want you to hear, the Father knows every time a sparrow falls to the ground. Now to me that's very important, that the, Jesus didn't just notice when a sparrow flies. <laughs> he wasn't just aware of it, that hey, when a sparrow flies, but when a sparrow falls to the ground. I mean, even with the sparrow, so many billions and billions of, of them, he notices caring about his creature, caring about the sparrow. He even notices when it falls to the ground. He knows when a sparrow falls, and he said, we are worth more than many sparrows. God isn't so preoccupied with other things going on in this world that he puts little value on you. He's still involved in your life to answer your prayers. And I like what I read, and I'm going to try to share it with you. The same mighty sun that keeps all the planets in orbit will ripen your tomatoes as if it has nothing else to do. And the same God who created this universe, who's involved in this universe, 
nevertheless cares enough to number every hair on your head. You're important to him. He cares about you. He cares about the specifics of your life. So first of all this morning, we've been looking at some common misunderstandings we often have as to why it is that God doesn't answer our prayers immediately. Second thing I want to look at then is this. There's a more proper way to understand the times when God does not answer our prayers immediately. With God, timing is more important than time. I want to repeat that. With God, timing is more important than time, and his timing is impeccable. We have our human timing timetable, we all do, for when we want God to act, right? Absolutely we do. <laughs> but he's following another timetable. So as we're talking about a more proper way to understand the times when God doesn't answer our prayers immediately, here's the first thing I want us to look at. Sometimes God delays answering our prayers as a means to bring more glory to himself. Look at John eleven four 4 again. Jesus said, this sickness that Lazarus is going through will not end in death. In other words, the sickness that Lazarus was going through was, it would be something by which he would pass through death temporarily. But Jesus is saying this sickness through which he's going through temporarily, it, temporarily, it will not end in death. He says, but it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may what? May be glorified through it. And later in John 11 verse 40, Jesus is going to say this to Martha. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see what? You would see the glory of God. Glory means attention. Glory means the spotlight. So let me ask you a question if that's what it means. What would give Jesus a greater spotlight? Healing a sick man or raising back to life a dead man? We all know the answer. God will always take the path that gives him the greatest glory. And God doesn't want to share his glory with anyone. Now think about it. Jesus could have, had he chosen to do so, he could have chosen and had the power to do it. He could have healed Lazarus long distance. He didn't have to get all the way to Bethany to, to heal him because he didn't have to be in Bethany because we know even from what we read earlier in the Gospel of John in John chapter 4, Jesus had healed the nobleman's son from several miles away. He spoke the word and immediately the son was healed. He could have done the same thing with Lazarus. But he had a different intention. You see what was going on here. God always takes the path, as I said a moment ago, that will give to him the greatest glory. He will do whatever it takes to make his name famous. Our job is to give him the glory and never try to steal his glory. So we're talking about these more proper ways to understand when God does not answer our prayers immediately. Sometimes he delays answering to bring more glory to himself. Here's a second reason. Sometimes God delays answering our prayers in order to bring about more spiritual growth in us. This might not be as apparent at first, but you will see it as we read along. Jesus told the disciples that Lazarus was sleeping. Now, they thought that when Jesus met 
said that, that he meant that he's just taking a snooze. But look at what John 11, verses 14 and 15 tells us. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there. Listen to the last part of this verse. So that you may believe. Jesus was saying, I believe that one reason he delayed is because I wanted you to grow in your faith. In other words, here's what he's saying in the context, I believe. He's saying like this. He says, some of you don't believe enough about me. Well, let's see how much you believe after I raise a man that's dead back to life. He was trying to teach his disciples and us that death is like sleeping. That death for the believer in Jesus Christ. Now, the person who's not saved, mm, it'd be wise for them to see they really do have something to be afraid of. But if we know Christ in the forgiveness of sin, death is not to be feared any more than lying down and pulling the covers up under your chin to sleep. Jesus took the sting of fear out of death for the believer. But he only does that if we're wise enough to keep remembering it and keep believing it because we get afraid too. God will often delay the answers to our prayers so that we will grow, grow in our faith. God answers prayer. And here are at least some of the ways that he answers. Several different authors have kind of put it this way, and it might help us to remember it. One way is this. If the request, if the request isn't right, God says no. That's an answer. Just because you pray it, it may not have been his. God's answer may be if it's not the right request. He says no. If the timing isn't right, then God says slow. So you got no and you got slow. Now, if you aren't right with God, he may say grow. But when the request and the timing and you are right with God, he often says go and claim your answer by faith. Now, I have to sort of sprinkle into this because I think that is very helpful what I've shared with you. But the thing I want to be careful of as a pastor, because I live in the same world you do. I have my hurts just like you do. I have pains just like you do. I have things that I don't understand I pray about just like you do. So I don't want to just lay out a formula, and although what I just said is very helpful, Sometimes you just keep on praying, you just keep on trusting, and you just keep on praying, and you keep on trusting, and you, you keep on praying, and you keep on trusting, and you keep on praying, and you keep on trusting, and you keep on loving him and knowing and believing because it's true, he loves you. Here's a third thing then. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way, the way we want them answered. Because he has something better in mind for us. I think you're enough like me that, you know, you got something you want to deal with and you, you feel, well, this will just happen. This will make it all right. So I pray for God to do that. So this thing, you know, he's God. I think he could figure it out. But he thinks, I get to thinking sometimes that I figured out the way it needs to happen. So God, if you'll just do this, it'll be all right. <laughs> And that that would be what's best for me, best for the situation. Now, that's what's going on in a way, kind of like with Mary and Martha here, because they thought that the best way for Jesus to show his love to them was to hurry up to their side and heal Lazarus. I mean, that would seem to make sense on the surface, right? But Jesus loved them with an everlasting love. There are many definitions of love. Here's one that I read. Love means giving us what we need most. 
Love means giving us what we need most. And at that particular time, what Martha and Mary and the disciples needed was an endless experience of the glory of God. And may I tell you, that's what we need too. We need to see a fresh revelation of the greatness and glory of God. And sometimes he asks us to wait in order to see more of the glory of God. In Isaiah 30, verse 18, the scripture says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. And then listen to this. Blessed are all who what? Who wait for him. A cardinal virtue is patience. Hmm. <laughs> it, is a, it is the virtue of allowing God to be God in God's own good time. Our lives aren't on our time. We live on God's time, not our time. I read of a pastor who was telling the story of another pastor, so I'm a pastor telling the story of a pastor telling another, another story of another pastor, all right? <laughs> so you ready? <laughs> so this pastor told a story about his bicycle when he was a kid. He's a part of a large family, and they didn't have much money for him to have a new bike. So here was his plan. He went out and he collected bicycle parts from scrap heaps until he made his own bicycle. He called it his Frankenstein bicycle because he put together an old frame with tires and handlebars that he had scavenged from different places. The problem was he didn't have any handlebar grips. So one Saturday morning... In December, he and his dad went to the Western Auto Store. This is that time when I take a time out and I try to think of whom I'm preaching to in terms of the different generations because uh, some of the younger generations, are Western Autos even around? I don't think they're around anymore. I don't know. But I grew up with them. <laughs> Most of y'all know. So that Saturday morning, he and his dad went to a Western Auto Store. And while he's in there, what do you suppose he saw? He saw a set of plastic handlebar grips with colorful streamers. And he said, Dad, please will you buy me these handlebar grips? My hands get sweaty and they slip off the handlebars. And I've fallen off many times and scraped my legs. Dad, I need these handlebar grips. But he said his dad just kind of shook his head and walked to the back of the store in some conversation with the owner of the store back there. And he said he stood there angry at his dad and he's trying to figure out how I'm going to get enough money to buy those handlebar grips. He said, well, a few weeks later, he got up on Christmas morning and he saw a brand new bicycle standing beside the Christmas tree. His dad says, son, the day you asked me to buy those handlebar grips, I was ordering this new bike for you. Then this pastor who's telling the story, the pastor, 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 <laughs> the pastor who was telling the story said, I forgot all about those handlebar grips but because my father had gotten me something so much better than the plastic grips 
for my Frankenstein bike. And then the pastor made the point. Sometimes when God says no to your request for handlebar grips, it's because the Father has a bicycle plan for you. And while we're talking about the different generations, let me just kind of close it out with another one that some will know, some won't. All right. There's a famous quote that appears in a song written by Babby Mason in 1989, and it contains a powerful truth. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Would you stand quietly, please? Lord, would you just do such a work in our hearts, God, that no matter what's going on in our lives at the present time, that, Lord, we'd just be overwhelmed with the truth that you love us. And the truth that you love everyone. Lord, I pray especially here today, God, for somebody who's been discouraged, maybe unknown to other people. Lord, just overwhelm them with the sense of the truth that you're still there. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for Jesus, the unmistakable demonstration of your love. And Lord, in our humanness, I know because I experience it just like the next person, that when we prayed about something and we don't see an answer, maybe we've been praying a while, temptation may be to give up. Lord, I pray that you would just encourage us, challenge us to keep on calling out to you. Keep on doing so in the understanding, Lord, that you care about us personally. You care about the details of what we're going through. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you need to have prayer at this altar, you can come and do that. If you need to talk to me about giving your life to Christ, you can do that. Whatever you do, just make the choice now that you're going to go forward living your life believing that Jesus loves you.
to you God we fight on our knees because ultimately we know we are not in control of anything but you are we trust you and we have faith in you because you love us so much thank you God for your love thank you for your patience give us some of that patience God that you give us and we just pray everything in Jesus name amen <laughs> 